is Matt Liss, the new head of Jewish Studies. Um, there, there it goes. Hi. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to this um, exciting event. Uh, those of you who would like to know about future events, there's an email um, sign up sheet in the back. Um, I think that I'd like to just hand it over to you, since you're the actual expert here. Okay. Okay. That's our new colleague, uh, Professor Atlas. One of the events that's coming in the future is um, one of the speakers is with us here now. Bill Morrow will be speaking on November 5th for the Rosen uh, lecture. My name is Ariel Saltzman, and I'm wearing a number of hats, I guess, today. Jewish Studies Chair of the Rosen Committee, and of course, from the History Department. Um, we're extremely happy uh, to have finally, um, her name has been, uh, you know, in circulation for a long time, I'm very happy uh, that Francesca Trevelato uh, has finally been able to make it here. Um, we're able to bring her here as our guest lecturer this evening. Um, I'm particularly thrilled because uh, she has been my host uh, at Yale for several conferences. Um, and she's also a fellow 18th century historian and one of a new breed of economic historians. Uh, so, and she's done much to revive uh, that field um, and expand it not just to the Mediterranean or Italy, where uh, the base of her research is, but uh, all around the world. Um, so, um, the mainstay of her research, as some of you might know, um, has been on the Jewish community of Livorno, of Leghorn. Um, through which became a lens on a global trading system, expanding on Philip Curtin's uh, notion of trading diasporas and actually you know, expanding it beyond belief in new directions and uh, with new theoretical implications. Um, so she's focused on this community um, and specifically in 17th, 18th century. Um, and um, she's written many works, uh, including her first book, uh, The Familiarity of Strangers, The Sephardic Diaspora, Livorno, and Cross-Cultural Trade in the Early Modern Period, which is a winner of many awards, including the AHA Leo Gursho Award for Outstanding Book Published in English on any aspect of 17th and 18th century European history, and has been translated into many languages, including uh, Japanese. Um, she has many, many articles and chapters to her credit. Um, and her latest book, which I'm now reading, is here, uh, The Promise and Peril of Credit. What a Forgotten Legend About Jews and Finance Tells Us About the Making of European Commercial Society. And it's a really fascinating book, which is um, going to also show why it's impossible to talk about the development of capitalism or the intersection between sort of um, economic anti-Semitism, past and present, how uh, that links up, especially in the areas of finance and credit. Um, because this book takes you from the Middle Ages um, and the early associations, negative associations, uh, of Jews and finance all the way to uh, modern. Uh, economic history and the works of Sombart. So it, it's quite, quite a span and is certainly going to not just make her mark on the early modern period, uh, but I think it's going to be essential reading uh, for anyone in economic history uh, more generally because it sheds a light on facets uh, of the um, early capitalist and later capitalist system as well as um, the intellectual apparatus behind it. Um, she comes to us today from, as you can see, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Um, but she was previously teaching both in Italy um, and for many years at Yale. Um, and without further ado, I will let uh, Francesca speak on the topic, today's topic, the threat of Jewish invisibility, medieval, early modern, and modern. Thank you very much to Ariel Saltzman for his generous introduction, uh, to Amitav Chaudhry for the invitation, uh, to the Jewish Studies and History colleagues for having me here, and the graduate students for a wonderful lunch, and to Sydney Fair for impeccable logistics. 
I just need my notes. So um, this talk is an attempt to pull a thread that uh, traverses the recent book that Ariel just mentioned and uh, connected to debates in Jewish history that I trust uh, will resonate both with those of you who are in the academy and those of you who are not. Because I don't need to remind you that the question that, you know, the question of what links medieval to modern anti-Semitism is possibly the most belabored and controversial topic in Jewish history. And this is one of the questions here I'm trying to tackle. Josef Heim Yerushalmi's 1982 Leo Beck Memorial Lecture titled Assimilation in Racial Antisemitism, the Iberian and the German Models, is among the most thought-provoking texts on the subject. Yerushalmi's argument is multi-layer, is, in my view, not entirely convincing, but it rests on a very compelling analogy according to which baptism stood to pre-emancipation Europe as legal equality stands to post-emancipation societies. Both phenomena nurtured the fear of Jewish invisibility, not the fear of the Jew as the other, but of the Jew as the everyman. According to Christian theology, baptism is a necessary rite of passage to enter the Christian covenant. It's a sacrament dispensed individually that renders all those who receive it equal to one another and in the eyes of God. Now for our purposes, the different uh, beliefs and practices adopted by specific Christian denominations are less important than the central tenet articulated by Paul, you can read here, for we are all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit drink. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now, the validity of these words has been put to test more than once in the millennium, in the, in the, in the two millennia plus during which Christianity has formally adhered to these words. The first crisis of a major magnitude in this respect was ignited by the more or less coerced conversion to Catholicism of Iberian Jews, first after a wave of deadly attacks to which they were subject in 1391-92, and then a century later after the decree of expulsion issued in 1492. In the wake of these mass conversions, as Yerushalmi put it, and these are his words, quote, the traditional mistrust of the Jew as outsider gave way to an even more alarming fear of the converso as insider. The converso being the former Jew who received the baptized. Around 1450, Secular authorities in Spain introduced new laws, the so-called Statutes of Purity of Blood, to distinguish between, quote, old and new Christians, between uh, families that supposedly had um, been baptized recently and therefore 
had been Jewish until recently. These laws gave rise to a number of genealogical inquiries into the past of the families of recent converts, um, and a heightened fear of all forms of mixings, mixing, not just between old Christians and Jews, but also uh, particularly after 1502, after the conquered, after uh, the kingdom of Granada, uh, which was the last holdout of a major Muslim power in Iberia, was uh, conquered by the Castilian crown. Um, in the very first years, Muslims were allowed to um, live as Muslim, but as of 1502, were also uh, forced to convert and, so convert, and so the mass baptism of, of Muslims on an even bigger scale, I should say, uh, provoked a very similar uh, crisis, and obviously a lot of forced baptism were um, uh, practiced by the Spanish authorities in the New World, uh, where here these are the so-called pasta paintings of the 18th century, you see this uh, anxiety about various mixing between uh, native people and Spaniards, between enslaved Africans, and also Chino con Indias. There were also um, slaves that were imported from East uh, Asia, uh, which were called the Chinos, in uh, uh, particularly Mexico and Spanish America. So Jews are part, which is important, you know, I'll focus on this, but are part of a bigger uh, phenomenon which is the fear of, you know, the desire and the violence of imparting baptism and the paradoxical, you know, of living with the consequences of those uh, actions. In 1478, with the creation of a modern monarchical inquisition in Spain, ecclesiastical authorities acquired a new powerful tool to identify and persecute those whom they accused of practicing Judaism in secrecy in spite of having been baptized. Yerushalmi regards the 15th century Iberian statutes of the purity of blood and the activities of the Spanish Inquisitions as the roots of modern racism and uses this analogy to contest what, when he was writing, was the prevailing notion that modern German anti-Semitism was a secular and even anti-Christian. And he wants to show how, in fact, in a deeply Catholic society as late medieval Spain, very, uh, in his view, analogous uh, anxieties with race, in his view, uh, could coexist and in fact be bred by the very uh, way in which uh, Christian theology has been uh, implemented by these ecclesiastical authorities. Now scholars before him, but particularly after him, have debated a, greater length, a very great length whether medieval Jewish anti-Jewish I mean, anti sentiments and legislation can be qualified as racist. The issue is very important. It's also very much alive in this moment in the academy. The medieval studies uh, uh, scholars and colleagues know that this is one of the um, harrowing and important questions uh, on the uh, both pedagogical and scholarly agenda of the moment. But this is not my own concern today. Rather, I want to pursue a different line of inquiry, which is very closely related to it, but it's a little different, and show that the fears posed by newly baptized Jews and their descendants mapped onto fears engendered by the expansion of the financial economy. So in what follows, I will build on uh, the work of other distinguished colleagues for the medieval and particularly for the, I mean, particularly for the medieval and very briefly for the modern period, and uh, will give you a uh, bit of uh, my own research coming from this recent book that Ariel mentioned. Now there are many reasons why I believe it is important to stress the allegorical functions 
that Jews have played for centuries in the Christian imagination of the market and of finance in particular. One reason is strictly academic, and it is a reaction against the tendency of most historians of economic thought, of European economic thought, to downplay religion in the analysis of early modern and um, modern economic thought, as if this was sort of as, as if religion only mattered <coughs> during the Middle Ages and not after. Another reason for my interest in this topic is in some way political in the broadest possible sense of the term. And I think that today, as many uh, liberal democracies in Europe and North America are confronted with rising levels of xenophobia, we're often told that hostility toward economic immigrants or asylum seekers is a response to the high level of unemployment and the widespread sense of economic insecurity. In fact, racism is uh, perfectly compatible with economic affluence, and that's also one of the reasons why it is so hard to eradicate it. So in this book, I try to identify a particular and particularly persistent manifestation of anti-Jewish prejudice, and that is the invocation of Jews in periods when private finance reshaped social and political relations, periods when the existing both written and unwritten codes about the morality of credit were no longer sufficient, and when it became harder and harder to define what financial malpractice is, and though in those moments it became easier to just call it Jewish. So let's look at the medieval period first, and let's start from medieval Italy. And there we find that anti-Jewish sentiments and legislation intensified during the centuries of the so-called commercial revolution. Uh, so it's important that uh, to know that it's around the year 1000 for the first time after the uh, decline and fall of the Roman Empire when Western Europe experienced a protracted period of sustained economic and demographic growth. Population growth in the pre-modern period means that the economy is doing well because it's a poor economy. So if people are alive, it means there's enough resources to feed them. So to some extent, population is a bit of a proxy for GDP, if you wish. So population grew steadily. Um, land and woods that were formerly abandoned was, uh, were put uh, to, uh, became arable land, a uh, number of cities, and the size of cities grew. The import and export of luxury goods from faraway regions increased. Uh, Overland and overseas routes began to connect very distant cities from Lubeck to Alexandria, from Odessa to uh, Bruges. Now I want to emphasize the connection between four phenomena that may not be evidently connected. And during this period, it's a period of erosion of feudalism with the rise of new social groups linked to long distance trade. It is a period when new financial instruments began to circulate in order to facilitate this trade. It is also the 12th and 13th century, the beginning of European anti-Semitism in the forms that later developed. And it's also a period during which, and this is important, the church was a leader, uh, was a moral leader for the society, was obviously uh, a point of reference for secular authorities. Um, the church was a leader in this rise of anti-Semitism, but contrary to what some of you may be taught in school, the, leader, the church was not unabashedly opposed to all forms of, contra, of commerce and finance. And so it's, it's, there's a very 
thin line, and that's where things get complicated and interesting. So in the city-states of the northern and the central regions of Italy, it's not a period of sort of the triumph of the bourgeoisie, it's, it's much complicated stories, but it is indisputable that uh, new groups that, whose wealth is tied to mobile wealth as opposed to the land uh, acquire greater social and in some cases political uh, prominence. <coughs> Notably in Florence and in Venice, the merchant is also a civic leader and a political leader and a good Christian. This is also the world in which, as I said, there are new legal contracts for which uh, there were no antecedents in uh, Roman law were devised to serve the needs of long distance trade, including marine insurance and bills of exchange, which you will see are the kind of hidden protagonists of the story I will tell briefly. These are um, Commerce, uh, these are contracts that simplify the transfer of funds across uh, distances and the lower the list, the risk for everybody involved. And so in so doing also facilitated uh, the uh, pooling of uh, money from larger segments of the population together. At the same time, this, uh, which I, we may call the new paper economy of the late medieval commercial revolution, also render these economic transactions more and more abstract and potentially opaque, particularly to those who were not specialists. Um, of, uh, and so just hold this thought, and we'll come back to these particular um, contracts. Now, churchmen at the time sought to harness these changes rather than to stifle them completely. And uh, the most uh, vocal uh, churchmen at the time in this um, process of setting the boundaries for the morality of the market were Franciscan friars, who were at the forefront of this balancing act, one in which they you know, convey their message about what was appropriate and what was not. In his sermons, San Bernardino da Siena, who was one of the most gifted rhetoricians of the time and a leading figure of the Franciscan order, he incessantly railed against heretics, usurers, sodomites, prostitutes, Jews, the vermin that infested Christian societies. But Bernardino also identified the city, the marketplaces, and its honorable merchants as the lifeblood of Christian society. He praised artisans, especially those in the woolen trade, in the woolen industry. For you know, this is pre-modern Europe. There's no central heating, and uh, woolen cloth is indispensable for everybody uh, to keep warm and productive. Um, he also praises those who, you know, worked leather, made shoes. He praised merchants who carried goods from where they were abundant to where they were scarce. One day, in one of his uh, uh, sermons, he noted that there was no pepper in Siena at that moment, and added that to transport and bring pepper to Siena would be to fulfill the common good. In short, the church was after commercial malpractice, you know, after oligopolies of fraud, deception, it was not after commerce as such. But how to enforce good conduct in the marketplace. That's was then and today still the big question of the day. So an easy answer, any time and place, is to have good laws and enforce them. And indeed, uh, municipal authorities regulated virtually every aspect of the market. And there's still, when you travel to these towns uh, across Europe, you often see um, 
the remnants, uh, for example, of uh, measurements units that were placed and that could not be tempered with so that uh, uh, it was more difficult to cheat uh, when you were making a transaction. Um, the merchants who went bankrupt were often asked to do public pendants. Uh, there were state convoys that were paid to escort uh, merchant galleys, for example, and all sorts of uh, uh, public services delivered by the state in order to make the market as transparent as possible. But as we know very well, lo laws alone are not sufficient to generate <coughs> compliance, and the morality of the market also depends on the cultural consensus of the people who inhabit it about you know, what constitute what is acceptable and admirable in those who conduct these transactions. And a very consistent yet changing way in which European society sought to create the consensus, particularly when that consensus was very hard to find, was by defining the Christian merchant in antithesis to the Jewish user. And the line separating the two was more symbolic than real, but that symbol was nourished itself from a growing arsenal of prejudice that found its confirmation, paradoxically, in the very norms and practices that it inspired. In an important and wonderful book, Dark Mirror, The Medieval Origins of Anti-Semitic Iconography, Sarah Lipton shows that it was when the medieval commercial revolution was in full swing that Jews acquired new identifiable traits in Christian pictorial representations. First exterior markers, such as a headgear, and later physiognomical traits. And importantly, uh, Lipton stresses how the church began to issue new norms to demarcate the lines of separating Jews from Christians at the very same time as the urban economy was booming and wealth was eroding those traditional feudal hierarchies that had made it very easy to know who was who in the city, if you wish. A landmark moment in this process, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this event, is the Fourth Lateran Council convened in Rome in 1215 by Pope Innocent III. It called for a new crusade and laid down new points of dogma and clerical reforms, but many of its decrees concerned the way of disciplining interactions between lay Christians and Jews, as well as Muslims. It ruled that Jewish men were obliged to wear a distinctive sign. It's not necessarily a yellow star, but it had to be a distinctive sign. Other groups, too, uh, in the in medieval cities, prostitutes had to wear um, something that outwardly you know, made them recognizable. <coughs> the grounds for this new uh, decree was, I quote, they, uh, I mean, the Jews, they upset the decorum of Christian religion by such a mixing. You know, the, the fear is that um, you can no longer tell who's the Jewish merchant and who's the, Jew and who's the Christian merchant. Uh, the Fourth Lateran Council also fulminated against sexual intercourse between Christians and Jews, usually Christian men and Jewish prostitutes. Uh, it also outlined um, Canon 67, it's an important uh, section of its uh, uh, proceedings. It outlined the first complete uh, understanding of what Jewish usury, would they quote, meant for the church. Now, in her book, Lipton notes that the headgear and the beard as identifiers of Jews began to appear in Christian art some 150 years before the Fourth Lateran Council, but initially they were neither used consistently nor associated exclusively with Jews. And in fact, it, the, the pejorative, aggressive meaning of these symbols that now we take for granted was very slow. 
the culmination of this process, you can see, for example, here is a caricature on uh, your uh, right, is a, from around 1340, from an illustrated prayer book that was made for the daughter-in-law of the King of France. Meanwhile, in Spain, uh, their friars too denounced the impossibility of distinguishing between Christians and Jews, but specifically used Jews as the negative standard again with to judge Christian merchants. Now I don't want to be fictitious, but there's something, you know, it's the church that had wanted to convert all these people. So they brought the problem onto themselves. And then they don't know how to solve the problem, and so they solve the problem through these uh, theological cultural loopholes. Uh, this is a Dominican friar, a very uh, successful preacher, who uh, speak of the expansion of commercial society. Today, nearly everything is avarice for almost everyone commits usury, which used not to be except by Jews, but today Christians do it too, as if they were Jewish. So that is when you no longer know how to you know, set the boundaries for the moral economy of the Christian community, then you accuse Christians of being like Jews. So to summarize what I said this far, during the late Middle Ages, religious conversions in Iberia and the moneyed economy in Italian city-states heightened the threat posed by the perceived invisibility of Jews and gave way to new legal but also new cultural strategies to impose more rigid divisions. So this is, I, I close here, the chapter of the so-called medieval period and enter into the early modern period. After 1492, these two phenomena, religious conversion and commercialization, both intensified to an even higher degree and took different forms in different areas of uh, Europe where Iberian Jews emigrated. After the 1492 uh, degrees, we can identify four main areas of emigration. One is the Ottoman Empire in Morocco, which was an independent in the Muslim uh, Mediterranean, which I won't talk about today. There they could live as Jews. Uh, the largest uh, number of Jews after 1492 went from Spain to Portugal, about 80,000 of them probably. And over time, some went to uh, certain cities in Europe, excuse me, in Italy, some went to uh, Hamburg, Amsterdam, later after 1656 to London, and a few to the southwest of France. So as I said, the greatest number initially went to Portugal, where in the wake of the 1492 decree, the Portuguese crown offered Jews a safe haven as long as they paid a hefty tax. But only five years later, in 1497, the king changed its mind and up, abruptly rescinded its promise of a safe haven and banned the open practice of Judaism, that is, Jews in Portugal too had to be baptized. However, it wasn't until 1536 that the Portuguese uh, ecclesiastical and secular authorities who had been lobbying Rome obtained the um, possibility of creating a modern inquisition modeled on the Spanish one. So this period between 1497 and 1536 is uh, the so-called golden age of crypto-Judaism in the sense that uh, Jews were forbidden from uh, practicing Judaism in the open, but the repressive machine, if you wish, was not as effective. It wasn't, uh, um, this is also the period when, you know, there was a lot of popular violence. Uh, Yerushalmi himself wrote a book on the 1506 Lisbon Massacre, which was a particularly violent um, massacre of uh, baptized Jews. Um, but the absence of a modern inquisition meant that Jews who had been coerced into baptism were relatively free 
to uh, practice a minimum of Jewish custom and secrets. Uh, uh, Inquisition trials later would talk about neighbors changing their shirts on uh, Friday night or sometimes mumbling words that they would not be able to recognize. So after 1536, uh, the Portuguese authorities uh, for a while also allowed Jews to leave um, rather than enforce uh, conformity and Yerushalmi has written an important uh, book on one figure who left Portugal, which is titled, the book is titled From Spanish War to Italian Ghetto. So this is one, the sort of the paradigmatic form of Jewish invisibility, if you wish. Uh, neighbors knew that these uh, were men, women, children who had been baptized recently, um, and yet they, you know, that, in that sense they were invisible, but no. In other areas of the Sephardic or Western world and Western Europe, Jewish invisibility took different forms. Uh, those who went particularly to Venice and to the port city in Tuscany of Livorno, there uh, they had to convert, they had to live as Jews. However, they, some of them had been Christians for quite a while, so their degree of adherence to normative Judaism was uh, imperfect at best, but also were given very ample privileges, and particularly the upper strata of uh, the mercantile society uh, you know, was very acculturated. In Venice, uh, there was a ghetto, the first one that had its name, uh, created in 1516. Uh, this is a portrait of a wealthy Western Sephardic Jewish merchant who lived within the ghetto, but uh, as you can see from this picture, is virtually indistinguishable from what a wealthy, um, perhaps not a patrician, but maybe even a patrician merchant in Venice would look like in terms of his attire. This is portrait on the eve of his uh, um, engagement to um, a Jewish woman from another uh, well-to-do Sephardic family. In uh, Livorno, the Medici uh, never created a ghetto in terms of a physically enclosed space. This was a unique situation for Catholic uh, Italy, Catholic Europe. Jews could live in the city. Uh, the poor ones all congregated behind the synagogue. The wealthier one lived uh, next to um, well-to-do Christian, you know, Catholic families. Uh, Jews in Livorno were even allowed to rent out part of their houses to Christians. It's a level of mixing that is absolutely unheard of in uh, counter-reformation Italy. Uh, but they had to live as Jews, so there are episodes of uh, Jews, Jewish men in particular, disembarking ships arriving from Spain and being put on a new ship to North Africa to be circumcised and returning to Livorno so that the Inquisition, which had an office in nearby Pisa, would not inquire into their, um, you know, because according to uh, Catholic theology, you're baptized once, you cannot be debaptized. So anybody who was arriving from Portugal or Spain would otherwise be subjected to the accusation of being uh, an apostate if he had not uh, joined formally the Jewish community. So this is a, an ambi is, is not quite Jewish invisibility. These, I want to say, these are, that's why I'm showing this picture, these are Jews, men, women, children, living as Jews in Italy, but with a degree of acculturation that had never been seen before in uh, uh, this part of Catholic Europe. In uh, Northern Europe, particularly in Amsterdam, the degree of acculturation was even higher, in part because uh, the uh, Dutch Calvinist authorities uh, never forced Jews to enter the Jewish community in the way in which both the Medici and the rulers of the Venetian Republic did. Uh, the Jewish community remained a voluntary association, the equivalent of the various uh, churches, 
that existed in the uh, Protestant world. This is also um, this is a contemporary picture of the great Sephardi synagogue in Amsterdam, and you can see that it's very unadorned and sort of more similar to the Calvinist churches. It's uh, um, and it, it is uh, um, I mean I don't know how perfectly uh, mimetic or, or it's the war, but um, there also we have portraits of the wealthiest of the merchant bankers uh, of Sephardic origin in Amsterdam, who sometimes uh, uh, you know, live with one foot in the community and one foot out. It was very much of a personal choice. And that's one of the reasons why they had two names, a Christian name and a Jewish name. They also used both names depending on which area of Europe they traded. So the point here is that uh, um, in these two areas, differently but with a lot of similarities, in, uh, um, in, the, in, in Northern Europe and in Italy, first of all, there's a, overall a considerable degree of accommodation and acculturation, particularly among the upper echelon of the Jewish community. And secondly, there's invisibility in the marketplace in the sense that both the Italians and the Dutch authorities allow these Sephardic merchants, when they act as merchants, to have exactly the same property rights as Christian merchants. And this is, again, quite rare and very important. Now, there's another area of Europe about which um, historians write less often, because we often forget that Iberia was not the only region of Europe where crypto-Judaism was, if you wish, an institutionalized reality, but that uh, also extended to the southwest of France. In 1550, the king of France issued an uh, invitation to les marchands et autres portugais appelés nouveaux chrétiens, to the merchants and other Portuguese known as new Christians, to come and live in the kingdom with their families. Now at the time, every understood, everyone understood what these words, merchants and other Portuguese, meant in part because of the geographical proximity and in part because of the temporal proximity uh, because the king's uh, invitation came just as uh, new Christians, newly baptized Jews, were leaving Portugal in greater number. The 1550 decree included some extraordinary concessions these uh, uh, newly arrived immigrants were not considered foreigners, were automatically considered subjects of the French crown, Renicole. They were free to move, to engage in any economic activity that they chose. They were also free to bequeath their assets, which wasn't the case for foreigners if you died uh, abroad as a foreign man uh, in France. The king had the right to seize your property. So in the wake of the 1550 uh, decrees, uh, great numbers of new Christians trickled across the border. You don't need to cross the Pyrenees, there's a nice beach. You can uh, uh, easily slip into France. Um, most of them traversed France to um, uh, go and settle uh, to Amsterdam or Hamburg, where they could live as Jews, but some uh, uh, settled in the area and uh, in Bordeaux and in the neighboring, uh, the neighboring towns which they made their homes. And Bordeaux, uh, <coughs> slowly at the time, and, and particularly later in the 18th century, was a booming Atlantic port. Not all the Portuguese, uh, the Portuguese merchants, within quote, uh, who settled there were rich, but a disproportionate contingent was involved in local, regional, transatlantic trade. Uh, the great uh, uh, transatlantic trade of the 18th century, both in uh, uh, plantation commodities and uh, in uh, enslaved Africans, was conducted, among others, by these Portuguese merchants. They played a particular, uh, a very important role, particularly uh, after 1621, when the truce between Spain and the United Provinces was suspended and, and trade between the two countries became illegal and the, these uh, Portuguese merchants created a sort of uh, 
corridor of contraband linking Iberia to Amsterdam. Now in France, uh, France is a Catholic country, was, still is, um, but um, because of the Gallican prerogatives of the French church, they uh, succeeded in not having the presence of a new papal inquisition that had been created in 1542 in Rome. And as a result, um, the, um, there weren't the same degree of ecclesiastical persecution as there was in uh, Spain and Portugal. So these Portuguese who came to live in Bordeaux and its surroundings, they were perpetually suspected of being crypto Jews. They were antagonized by the local population, both as religious infidels and as political enemies because there was a lot of suspicion. There were a lot of wars between Spain and uh, France. They were also mistrusted by merchants who perceived them rightly or wrongly as uh, um, you know, competition. But as I said, they were free from inquisitorial persecution and the king, who regarded them as an economic asset, entrusted, uh, you know, was entrusted, tried to ensure their protection and well-being. So we have, for example, correspondence between uh, the royal officials in the region and Paris uh, uh, that is very, um, there's a memoir from 1688 uh, that speaks of the Juifs qui sont dans cette province sous le nom de Portugais. The Jews who reside in this province under the name of Portuguese. It's, it's in the official papers. There's no, you know, there's, there's, there's no means in the world. But having acknowledged that, the royal official nevertheless, uh, you know, dis was charged by the king to discourage them to emigrate. Uh, in fact, threatened them to confiscate their property because. Uh, at the time, the France was, uh, uh, you know, very wary of the United Provinces. They didn't want these merchants to flee there and uh, um, try to provide enough safety for them to stay. Now, this is the broader context in Bordeaux, uh, the sort of the background of uh, the time and place when a Bordeaux lawyer by the name of Etienne Clérac edited a volume of maritime laws titled Une et Coutume de la Mer, Usages and Customs of the Sea. And today, both the name of this author and the title are virtually unknown. But as you can see for the num from the number of uh, re-edition of this book, it actually was a very successful uh, 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 volume. Uh, it was first published in 1647, and uh, the significantly enlarged 1661 re-edition was printed in at least 1,200 copies, which is, some of you are book historians, is an exceptionally high print run. Any religious text, excuse me, any non-religious text, uh, including in the 18th century, including uh, Bob Darton's uh, Forbidden Bestsellers, very rarely were printed in uh, uh, a thousand copies or more. You can see from the frontispiece here, this is uh, um, the coat of art of the Regent Queen of France. And there's a motto inscribed in both Latin and Greek that translates potent over sea and over land. So the book is dedicated to the French monarchy at the time when the French monarchy is trying to affirm its power um, over the very competitive arena of international trade and colonial power. The author of Clérac was uh, a barrister. He worked in the regional parlement, which was the royal um, tribunal in uh, Bordeaux, or the, one of the largest in France uh, for jurisdiction. He also, for a few years, worked as a legal officer in the Admiralty Court, which uh, means that he participated in all sorts of legal disputes about uh, um, mariners and ship captains, and uh, he was also involved in a very um, complicated uh, shipwreck that involved uh, direct negotiations between uh, the French king and Olivares in Madrid. 
So he was not a merchant himself, but he had gotten to learn about merchant practices firsthand. He was a devout Catholic and a partisan of the monarchy during the period of the Fronde. And his aim was to provide other legal pr practitioners like him and royal officials an instrument to learn about what were the written norms and the customary norms to settle dispute about uh, maritime and commercial affairs. Because at the time, of maritime law and commercial law were not taught in law school. It was a very big law school in Bordeaux from which he graduated. But he felt he had acquired a lot of knowledge. And the book was successful in large part because uh, the treatises of maritime and commercial law up until then were written in Latin. And this was written in vernacular. So as he compiled this law, this book, which is very technical in some aspects, he also jotted down very long commentaries. And in these commentaries, he port, you know, sort of he offers a very rare portrait for this early 17th century period of what were the um, you know, common practices, but also the merchant ethic of the time. And interestingly, his commentaries alternate between praise and disparagement for merchants and, and bankers. He here describes them as the treasure of society and the state as long as they behave honestly, but condemns those who act as profiteers. And even if he's using law, the laws he was commenting never really told him exactly how to draw that line, which is, I think, part of the reason why the commentary grew long and rather wild, as we're about to see. So what distinguished these two groups? What qualified somebody as a dishonest merchant? And Clairac never found a proper answer in the very laws he was commenting, and so he decided to tell a story. A story in which Jews stand in for fraudulent behavior with a rhetorical penchant that reveals the self-evidence of such claim for his readers, and a story that uh, has uh, long been forgotten, but at the time added an insidious and original, in some ways, twist to a plethora of well-worn stereotypes. So what's this story? This story appears in Clairac's glossing of um, authoritative uh, um, sets of norms about marine insurance. Remember that I showed you a marine insurance policy from Berger. And there he writes, insurance policies and bills of exchange were unknown to ancient Roman jurisprudence and are the posthumous invention of Jews, according to the remark of Giovanni Villani in his Universal History. The first time I came across these words, I kind of, kind of couldn't believe it, because economic historians know very well that this is not true, and yet uh, um, repeated over and over this uh, uh, story can be found uh, across many, many texts. It captivated great minds like Montesquieu and Karl Marx, uh, as well as it was broadcasted by a myriad of texts uh, thereafter, and to some extent inspires some counter-narratives. So I don't want to go into too much detail about you know, these words. I'll be happy to take questions. Um, first, it's interesting that this is, as I said, it's a commentary about marine insurance, and he adds bills of exchange, because by the middle of the 17th century, questions of usury and marine insurance had been settled, while the more puzzling instruments were those called bills of exchange, which were thin slips of papers, smaller than a modern personal check, they were scribbled in coded words, and they were sufficient to transfer funds from one city to another, and simultaneously to transfer, to, to, to convert one currency in another. <coughs> so they had this two double function of credit, there's a temporal interval between when they were purchased and then when they were redeemed, and you would purchase this in, purchase this, purchase them in one currency in one town, and redeem them in the local currency in another town. Now, coinage, fraud, and clipping 
have long been and remained a major concern in marketplaces the world over, and it is not a coincidence that uh, uh, the clipping of coins was often attributed to, you know, it was a frequent accusation levied against medieval Jews. But paper instruments intensified fears about fraud because they dissociated the value from anything tangible. These, these are just pieces of paper that you, know, you, don't, you don't have to temper with your, you, know, you don't have to taste the tender of the coin. And they were also very difficult to decipher unless you were one of those who really knew how to handle them. But here you can hear an echo of some of the complicated financial instruments in which Maybe not in Canada, but in the U.S., our pensions, you know, uh, depend on. But we don't really. We want them to perform that magic, but we don't really know how that can happen. You can see he was a. This is not a central central street in Bordeaux, but he's still remembered as an important uh, figure in the history of the town. So in his commentary, Clérac uh, refers to Jews very harshly. He uses theologically inflected vocabulary. But the real targets of his invectives are not Jews. As you read uh, the seven pages that follow that implausible statement, in fact, his real targets are Lombards. Lombards is a term that originally referred to moneylenders hailing from northern Italy, and that soon uh, encompassed to all Christian lenders in the Middle Ages, particularly those who operated north of the Alps. And in Clérac's account, Lombards, having absorbed the teaching of the Jews, they began to extort usurious rates from naive Christian debtors. So the charge here is that Christians have become like Jews, very much like the way um, the Dominican Spanish preacher had said. But Clérac also notes uh, that uh, these Lombards were considerably worse than Jews because they were Christians who behaved like Jews, but also they were more dangerous because they were not recognizable. So in his commentary, he says, that at least Jews were hated, treated harshly, and continuously ridiculed. He notes that the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215 that we mentioned uh, had obliged Jews to wear a uh, bonnejum, a yellow hat, which marked them apart from the rest of the population. By contrast, nothing distinguished a Lombard outwardly from a reputable Christian merchants. And then he also adds that uh, Christian kings have a tendency to cause up with these uh, Lombards, and he cites uh, 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 1270, uh, 1274 church canon, the abyss of usury that had, in which the church had ordered Christian rulers to expel the Lombards, but it took many centuries for the French king to actually implement. They were they more easily expelled Jews than they expelled Lombards. The point, however, is that Clérac did not aim to condemn all forms of credit, nor was he interested in Jews qua Jews. Rather, he deployed Jews as a trope to address his real concern, which was the growing influence of private finance, as evidenced by the increasing diffusion and intricacy of marine insurance, but particularly of bills of exchange. It was this difficulty of uh, marking a thin and clear line of division that animated him. Now, the context in which he write, as I said, was Bordeaux, where this fear of Jewish invis invisibility had a particular resonance because of the 1550 decree. In addition, Clérac also lived through a little known but really crucial period in French history, which is the first half of the 17th century. Now, traditionally, uh, the French monarchy had the Loi des Dérogions, uh, which was a law that prohibited French aristocrats 
from engaging in manual labor, from conducting commerce, or even from serving as magistrates. If they did so, they lost their noble prerogatives, which means they had to pay taxes, because in France, at the time, noblemen didn't pay taxes, so you, you know, think about it twice. In 1756, a famous today, and much debated by historian, pamphlet appeal and the best commerçant, the commercial nobility, uh, on which historians have written a lot, which was uh, um, a pamphlet urging aristocrats to engage with commerce for the productive good of the kingdom. But what I want to emphasize here is that the process of allowing, and in fact, even uh, favoring aristocratic investment in commerce began much earlier. It began in 1629, uh, and then was largely codified by 1669. In fact, in 1673, in a famous piece of legislation, the French finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, the Ordonnance de Commerce, stated that everyone who signed a bill of exchange would be subject to the jurisdiction of tribunals run by merchants. This is important because it means that, that if an aristocrat used bills of exchange for their credit speculation or their payments, uh, if something went wrong, if he did not pay his bills, he would then be tried by a tribunal of commoners, uh, which was, uh, uh, you know, basically he lost his prerogative, his quality as uh, aristocrat. And that was, you know, something that the crown had uh, put into law. So in short, long before the French Revolution did away with feudalism, the crown was introducing small but significant changes in a feudal regime and an anti-commercial ideology that had nurtured its legitimacy for centuries in the hope of advancing France's stature in global commerce. So the baseless attribution that Clairac put into print of the invention of bills of exchange to medieval Jews found its way into print at a moment when these bills had reached an unprecedented level of complexity and the age-old culture of inheritable aristocratic honor was being eroded at a faster pace than ever before. Now skipping to the French Revolution, in August 1789, as you all know, the National Constitutional Assembly, Constitutional Assembly, abolished feudalism, and between September 1790 and January 1791, between January 1790 and September 1791, Jews, at least Jewish men, acquired full legal and civic equality for the first time in the history of Europe. And emancipation propelled the question of Jewish invisibility into its modern incarnation. So I don't have time to discuss the 19th and 20th centuries in any detail, but let me conclude uh, by returning to my starting point, the question of medieval anti-Semitism and modern pseudo-racism. And I do so by uh, way of a long but important quotation from one of the earliest, bravest scholar of modern anti-Semitism uh, in the post-war period, the French scholar Dion Polyakov, who is uh, uh, in his uh, third volume of his monumental, The History of Anti-Semitism, reads, as long as Jews actually lived under a special legal regime, they were regarded in good theological doctrine as possessing all the attributes of human nature and the curse hanging over them as being only an expiation from the point of view of Christian anthropology. It was when they were emancipated and able to mix freely in bourgeois high society that the curse became, under the terms of the new so-called scientific anthropology, a biological difference or inferiority, and that the spy's class became an inferior race. It was as if the badge or canonical hat of Europe were henceforth carved 
internalized into their flesh, as if Western opinion could not dispense with a definite distinction, and that this distinction became an invisible essence once the visible symbols identified the Jew had been raised. This is sort of a standard account. Now, unlike Yerushalmi, Polyakov imagines the medieval and early modern periods as time when the boundaries between Jews and Christians were clear. So in this talk, I followed Yerushalmi in stressing that fears of Jewish invisibility had long preceded emancipation. But I also parted ways with Yerushalmi by noting that those fears were not unique to Iberia, or found that they found other expressions in new regions of Europe where different arrangements were devised to accommodate a Jewish minority. And also, I show that the perceived threat of recent converts or highly acculturated Jews gave voice to the ambivalence toward the creative and destructive power of commercial credit. And I do so because a great deal of ink has been spilled about how both the left, with capital L, and the right, with capital R, have deployed violent anti-Jewish imagery to demonize capitalism, especially in its international financial guises. In my work, I wish to elucidate a related but different phenomenon, a phenomenon that we don't talk about as often, and that is the protean consistency with which medieval, early modern, and modern authors invoked the figure of the Jewish usurer not to condemn commerce and capitalism outright, but as a shortcut whenever changing circumstances shatter the legal and cultural consensus about the morality of credit. In both pre- and post-emancipation European societies, the rise of commercial groups and the expansion of private finance provoked a crisis of legibility at different moments in time that jeopardized existing social and political hierarchies. The figure of the Jewish usurer then provided an illusory stability, the demarcating line between the upright and the shameful merchant. Until the middle of the 20th century, the invisible Jew, not the invisible hand, was a staple of European debates about the place of finance politics and society. Thank you. I think Francesca will take I'll questions. take a pen in case I need to annotate your question. Can you please? I have. Just quickly, is that actually you walking the table? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> you interpreted my dreams. <laughs> So, um, we know part of the book uh, um, is... Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. So, the question was about um, the British con 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 context. In 1756, um, there's a proposal to naturalize foreign uh, well-to-do British, uh, or foreign well-to-do Jews who have been residing in Britain for a certain period of time, uh, which uh, is passed in Parliament, but because of a 
outright popular um, revolt against it is actually immediately uh, pulled back. Um, and um, it's interesting because some of the background that leads to this uh, uh, piece of legislation is um, often the, you know, studied because of some important pamphlets that the promoter uh, of this piece of legislation write uh, linking uh, the commercial contribution of these uh, well-to-do Jews, some of them Sephardi, some of them by Dem Ashkenazi, to the well, you know, to the coffers of the state. Uh, and so uh, there's a kind of uh, proto-commercial argument in favor of something that is not quite emancipation, but the most similar things before it. Um, and uh, so you, you know, you can see British history in the pre-1756 as sort of there being the arguments laid down for uh, a political argument in favor of greater rights, civic, um, but, you know, rights to Jews based on their economic contribution. But after 1756, you also, you know, have the opposite story whereby that piece of legislation is not enacted and it takes until the middle of the 19th century um, for uh, Jews to uh, be granted full emancipation. Um, so the British story, it's really complicated because it's the most commercial society if you compare it to France, and yet France arrives first. And, um, so in the, in the book, I tried to trace uh, the um, reception of this story that is primarily a French story outside of France. Um, and interestingly, um, I find that um, in England, and later in Britain, um, the association between Jews and finance have less to do with bills of exchange, in part because it is a more commercial society, so these bills of, and there are the so-called inland bills within England where, you know, they're, they're, these financial instruments are more widespread even among the middling sorts. Um, while the associations, the negative associations, are more between Jews and the stock market. Um, and so in England uh, in 1720, there is a huge financial crack of the stock market, the so-called South Sea bubble. Um, and, uh, and so it, it's also a way of, of thinking about how there are various, you know, the sort of, the, in, in fact, in my book, I argue that the, the Catholic-Protestant divide is not as significant as we have come to think about uh, from Weber onwards. Um, but it's more about the position of Jews in different uh, polities and the status of commerce and finance in different. So only in Amsterdam and in London in the 18th century, there is a really uh, significant presence of a stock market. And in those two uh, areas, uh, the negative deployment, the deployment of, of negative stereotypes about Jews is more associated with it. So the excess of finance, which is, you know, Jews are not the only imagery. Uh, there's a very feminized image of credit. Um, uh, Daniel Defoe's coined the term lady credit to denounce, uh, uh, you know, the instability of, uh, so, so I also want to, you know, so we want to also study these uh, uh, imagery of uh, um, this prejudice in relation to um, negative attitudes toward other groups, which can be women or other uh, immigrants. Considering uh, Venice's reliance on American commerce, do you find similar concerns with the Venetian text at this time? Um, so the, the Italian uh, texts are somewhat um, less uh, uh, susceptible to uh, this uh, uh, trope um, because, relatively speaking, uh, with, in Italy, there is a much clearer demarcation between Jews and Christians. Um, so as I said, there's a, among the upper echelon of um, you know, the population in the ghetto, you may have images, that's the one I showed, but uh, uh, there is a ghetto, 
uh, the, that uh, the doors of the ghetto do close at night. Uh, there are Jews who escape, there are Jews who, you know, there's policing uh, all sorts of social, personal, uh, legitimate and by the period standards, illegitimate intercourse between Christian and Jews. But there is a both legal and social demarcation that is harder. Yeah, I'm curious, given that the Christian church is in itself a giant economic organism, how much of the vilification of Jews in general and Jewish mer merchants is an economic factor? In other words, to disparage the competition, if you will, and also because Christian merchants and people will pay tithes to the church, it's another way to fill a coffer by creating new Christians. Absolutely. I mean, uh, that is one of the reasons why the church, as you said, could not, you know, be a autarkic or socialist uh, uh, utopian uh, uh, advocate because they were often the richest proprietors in the area, uh, both of land and real estate and of movable wealth. And that is one of the many reasons, but one of the primary reasons why they had to develop this acrobatic uh, moral, theological, economic thought and doctrine so as to devise legitimate and illegitimate practices. Uh, these debates are extremely intricate precisely because the church had no, neither interest for the community at large, nor any self-interest at curbing all forms of profits. Um, so some of the um, complicated uh, lease and credit contracts that the church used uh, in order to, because when, when the church accepts a bequest, they can never sell it on the market, uh, you know, which is actually very similar to the Ottoman Empire. The, the walks, there, you know, a lot of historians say, oh, the backwardness of the uh, Ottoman Empire is due to the non <laughs> But in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the all ecclesiastical property are technically excluded from market transactions, but as in the walks case, uh, so the church, the complicated financial instruments that are developed in order to mobilize that wealth. Um, at the same time, I think we don't want to think only in these uh, somewhat cynical terms. I think they have absolutely a role to play. But as the sermons of Bernardino de Siena that I invoked very briefly um, point to, you know, there is really Christian society and these urban commercial cities uh, were identified. You know, there was. The, 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 there was a, there was a, the, the city where all these transactions happened were also supposed to be a good Christian society. Um, and so both, uh, bo both uh, the more spiritual and the more material interest uh, absolutely coincided. Uh, but because it was so difficult um, back then as today, uh, we all, I mean, not all, but you know, we won the financial world to, to work for Main Street as well as for Wall Street, right? That's sort of the problem. Um, and uh, we, we're not, collectively, we're not exactly sure how to make that happen. Um, and and that, there, are, there are similarities, I think, with the world I'm trying to describe. Just, just building on that, where, where Christian attempts to um, kind of circumvent the Jewish money lenders always uh, I mean, most of them fail, but to what extent were they always in relation to this Jewish competition? I'm thinking of like the Monte mm -hmm. in the 15th century and how they, they pretty much failed because they didn't have high enough interest rates. And uh, I mean, is this a, a parallel history of finance that the, um, the, the, the Christian attempts, or was it always seen in relation to the invisible Jew that was running things? Well, that, that, that's a very good question in part because uh, this, um, what, it's, it's a bit of a circuitous answer, but I think I'll get to what you're um, asking. This, uh, when I, you know, this, I call it this legend of the Jewish invention of bills of exchange. 
initially when I read it, I thought, oh, it attributes the invention to medieval Jews. It must be a medieval idea. But in fact, it is not a medieval idea. It took me a while to figure it out. Because in, this middle, in, the, in the late Middle Ages, you know, before uh, the expulsion from Iberia, uh, during the commercial revolution, one way in which the distinction was made is most Jewish credit in, from the 12th to the 14th century, uh, 15th century in, uh, in Italy, consumer credit was run by the Jews. But the upper echelon of the international finance was completely Christian. Think about the Medici bank, the, you know, throughout the 15th century, the largest bank in Europe is run by a very upright family that, you know, there's a pope. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and so one way in which this um, segmentation of the market is literally created is by having, uh, in, in theory, you can, you can, go, you know, the, the, the Jew, you cannot, the Jewish pawnbrokers can only lend to the poor. It's sort of a stand-in for the absence of public services in that area. Although, as you say, the Franciscan Monti began, Monti di Pietà began to began to, to create a, a you know a competition in this respect. But you cannot, you know, so if you you know if you're an entrepreneur and you have an idea, there's no venture capitalist. You cannot mortgage your house. Uh, you cannot go to a Jewish broker in theory to get uh, capital to set up a business. Okay, so the the economy is the market in that level is segmented uh, legally. Then after the 1550s, in the in the port cities of Europe, I didn't you know explain very well, but I think this is important. After 1550, in Livorno, in Venice, in Amsterdam, <coughs> this division doesn't exist. If you are a Sephardic merchant involved in regional or international trade. Uh, you can do any contract, you can trade in anything in Amsterdam and London. You can even buy stocks and bonds, which you can understand. So the, the, the public debt is invented in late medieval Italy. But uh, if you're, uh, you know, a, say, a Jew in medieval Italy, you cannot buy uh, state bonds. There's not a, you know, that's an important form of symbolic citizenship. While in the 17th century, you can buy bonds in the, you know, you can buy uh, 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 shares of the Bank of England. Uh, you can buy shares of the EOC, the Dutch East India Company, which they did. Uh, that you can still not intermarry because marriage before emancipation is a sacrament, is not. Um, and so there are many spheres of your life, and credit is often tied to family networks, so there are many f spheres of your life in which social and legal segregation exists. But when you go to conduct market transactions, you're actually like any other merchant. In Amsterdam in particular, the municipal authority, they go as far as prohibiting any immigrant community even you know Genoese or um, Venetians or Jews, um, to for, uh, prevent them from having their own consular jurisdiction and deal their disputes internally, they have to go. Everybody in Amsterdam is a sort of the kind of open society before uh, modern you know, the modern period. It's unique in it's unique a situation in, in Europe, but it's telling at the time. You they have you have to go to the municipal tribunals or the Supreme Court of Holland. That means that, you, you know, and, and as, 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 as a Jewish merchant, you have the exact same property rights as any other, other merchant. And that creates, you know, a form of invisibility in terms of the kind of hierarchies that existed before. Thank you. 
incorporate um, to the same kinds of conditions, or are these sort of, as a result, of trying to attract certain kinds of expertise and capital, so not to make any concessions? I'm just wondering about the picture. It's a very, very good question. Um, so the, the question, did you hear it? I really didn't hear it. Uh, the question is about uh, whether the kind of uh, privileges and the cultural reactions to this privilege that I spoke about was unique to the Sephardic Jews who left Iberia or extended to other pre-existing Jewish community in various uh, locales. Or, um, so, two things. Um, in Italy, where these Sephardic Jews had to live as Jews, the, lo the ruling authorities, both in Venice and Livorno, are very explicit in creating hierarchies between Jews. Um, for example, in Tuscany, the pre-existing Jews, just before the Sephardim are allowed to, uh, to uh, are invited to arrive, are obliged to resettle in two ghettos that are created one in Florence and one in Siena. So the Italian Jews are enclosed in the ghetto 20 years before the Sephardic Jews are invited with special privileges. In Venice, similarly, there are three communities that are created with different uh, charters in 1516 uh, and words. And in, in, in at different moments, the, the Italian, Ashkenazi, Levantine, and Sephardic Clementine communities are given different privileges. And when you read the charters, you see that the Venetian authorities are creating an economic hierarchy. <coughs> that, for example, the Italian Jews are only allowed to conduct two economic activities, which is trade in used goods and retail of uh, you know, sort of petty you know, reused uh, textiles. So they are confined to the kind of poor uh, economy. And when you read the privileges of 1590, uh, excuse me, 1589, that are extended to, in order to encourage these Varanos who are leaving Portugal, the kind of privileges are you know, tailored, made for this communities that is basically of baptized uh, uh, new Christians. In Amsterdam, it's more complicated because, as I said, well, in, it, in Venice, it's complicated because they are all live, they have multiple synagogues, but they all live within one ghetto, and I'm sure several of you have visited the ghetto. It's pretty small. It, it is enlarged, and different areas are created, but there's a lot of mixing, and so over time, but there is some resistance to intermarriage within the Jewish community. Um, in Amsterdam, the authorities never, you know, recognize these different communities, but um, some historians, one in particular, uh, uh, Josef Kaplan, a great historian of the Sephardim of Amsterdam, from whom uh, I think I had quoted it in Gloss, but he, he talks about uh, the high degree of acculturation of these Sephardic Jews. He goes as far as um, arguing that these Sephardic Jews, particularly the uh, most well-to-do members of the community, adopted, internalized, a limpieza de sangre mentality to exclude Ashkenazi Jew. And indeed, there are community statutes that forbid intermarriage between Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews. Um, so in that case, it's a, a policing mechanism that is more internal to the Jewish community, although the numbers are so imbalanced because with the growing Ashkenazi immigration, particularly from the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth um, after the end of the Thirty Years' War into Amsterdam, uh, soon uh, the Sephardic uh, uh, merchants and the Sephardic, uh, the Portuguese Sephardic Jews are outnumbered, and so they were, you know, both in Amsterdam and in uh, and in uh, London there is a very acculturated, wealthy Ashkenazi, um, Dutch and British uh, Jewish communities. But uh, it is not a, as much as a top-down uh, demarcation as it is in Italy. I think Ariel, you had a yeah, question. Yeah, no, I had a question. 
because I wanted uh, you to speak more about this um, sort of conjuncture, because you know the Ottoman and the, the Franco-Ottoman Treaty of 1740, where it very specifically includes bills of exchange. It's the first time it's mentioned. And of course, Etienne Alden has a huge uh, study on that. So I'm wondering where you would posit this sort of diatribe of Clairac uh, in that, because you've got Colbert in the mix promoting uh, trade. Um, and so is, is there that moment of crisis mm -hmm. when bills of exchange are being accepted uh, or even promoted by the state and reaction uh, mm -hmm. from uh, certain merchants or their advocates? Mm -hmm. um, well, in part, you know, bills of exchange during the 16th century mm -hmm. become simultaneously more widespread mm -hmm. and more complex. So there, are, you know, there begin to be essentially two types of bills of exchange. Those are used as remittances, yeah. but there are also an even smaller group of merchant bankers who are able to use this instrument as purely, you know, for financial speculation. You know, they speculate on currency arbitrage. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the simultaneous uh, uh, process heightened uh, these uh, uh, anxiety, but they become a very routine, as you say modes of payment and uh, as, uh, as the scholarship you just quote shows that there are European, Latin, Christian, French merchants and Ottoman official and Ottoman merchants, Muslims, Greek and uh, Christians in the Ottoman Empire who use them although these bills tend to circulate you know within not very large um, networks because they, they're not like paper money because paper money is guaranteed by the state. What guarantees a bill of exchange is the signature. And in a world in which there is no credit scores, you need to know something about that signatures. And so it's that that restricts a little bit. But in, in, in a situation like Istanbul, where there's a, you know intense uh, sociability and, and presence in the marketplace, they also cross divisional, uh, excuse me, uh, confessional divides. So this is, you know, so this is the moment because because these bills of exchange <coughs> oil international commerce. I mean, when I started this project, um, I had a very ambitious uh, goal that I had to, you know, relinquish, which I was trying to. I, I would have wanted to see whether the identity of those involved in these credit networks actually had an impact on the interest rates that were charged. Mm -hmm. That is extremely, it's nearly impossible in part because in order to bypass usury prohibition, you actually cannot separate the currency conversion from the interest rate. So you, um, and also because uh, it's, because we're good historians, you don't really want to use last name as proxies for identity, you know, find a Greek name in Istanbul, you know, is it a Catholic Greek, is it an Orthodox Greek to which community, and so forth. Um, but what I want to say is that this is not just a legend that is mobilized by, you know, it's sort of in the circle of high ideas and intellectual for purely polemical arguments. I have found you know, written echoes of this legend in the administrative papers of some, uh, particularly of one council of commerce that advised the French crown. So in some ways it did percolate in the everyday commercial culture. It doesn't mean that there was plenty of commercial credit in Bordeaux, in Amsterdam, in Venice between Jews and Christians. And when everything went right, fine. But when, uh, you know, this was one way, and I think we're very familiar with this phenomenon, uh, one way when, when things became difficult, or when, you know, then there was this sort of, well, you, you, you could, you know, it was always there. It was, this, it was this sort of infinite arsenal of imagery that you could invoke. And so I don't, you know, the, the reason why I think one of these reasons the texts I analyze in the books are interesting because they encompass a very wide spectrum. They go from the writers of the French Enlightenment 
down to little commercial books in which you have, I don't know, instructions for how to write a bill of exchange or the exchange rates. Um, and so, so the, the, the kind of commercial culture of the 17th, 18th century that historians have tended to portray as ever more secular, ever less uh, uh, impinge upon by the church continues to mobilize those uh, uh, traditional Christian imagery in order to uh, describe the things that are hardest to describe precisely as that commercial practice becomes more sophisticated, more abstract, and more impersonal. We have a reception upstairs. Uh, Thank you so we sh unless there's a really pressing question, let's adjourn and uh, move to the reception, but not before giving you a great round of applause.